Let's pray together. Gracious God and Father, would you now soften our hearts to hear and receive your holy word? Would you open our ears to hear it in such a way that it penetrates the deepest part of who we are and affects by your spirit lasting and meaningful and Christ-exalting change for his glory and for your name's sake. Amen. What are the things in your life that you would say are worth fighting for? The things that rouse you from apathy to action. What's worth fighting for to you? I know for some of us, it might be uh, a favorite nonprofit organization or, or a good cause. I know uh, some of you right now are raising some funds for Pregnancy Help Center. Their Walk for Life is coming up here soon. Similarly, others of you are uh, helping the Mahoney Valley Rescue Mission and their Move Our Mission campaign. Both of those uh, extremely worthy causes, very much worth fighting for. Here's one I know I'm sure none of you have gotten caught up in, but one that I've observed from time to time, and that is a, a hearty uh, debate over a social or political issue on Facebook. I've never seen uh, when someone posts a, either a left or right-leaning article, any of you uh, now gear up or someone takes a jab at maybe your favorite politician, I've never seen any of you come off the top rope to contend for your favorite, maybe once or twice. Or something maybe that it's a little bit more close to home. How about, uh, how about a child or your children? Maybe you have previously or currently one of your children or grandchildren maybe is struggling academically or socially. Maybe they've suffered at the hands of a bully. And so you, you take action, right? You advocate for them. You contend for them. You, you fight for them in their best interest. It could be your marriage. It could be a friendship. It could be a variety of things. We all have them. What is it in your life that you would say is worth fighting for? That's really the big question that we bring to the scriptures this morning. What's, what's the thing? What's the thing? Is there, is there such a thing, such a noble cause of immeasurable value that is worth contending for? In fact, to get the answer this morning, uh, I feel compelled that we need to study an entire book of the Bible to get the answer. So I figure after about three or four hours, we should probably be, be pretty dialed in to, to what that great noble cause is. No, we come, somebody's excited, only one of you, you will stick around for that. <laughs> uh, thankfully, uh, we explore a small but powerful little book of the Bible to try to, to find the answer to that big question. So would you uh, join me then in the book of Jude? The book of Jude's on page 1027, if you're gonna use a pew Bible, little but mighty, letter in the New Testament. If you're not sure where to find it, if you just turn to the end and find Revelation, just go left. There's one book to the left of Revelation. The little book of Jude. We're going to read uh, almost the whole letter, and so I would encourage you, uh, just by way of discipline and mental staying power, uh, to stick with the flow of thought. Uh, we will read through most of it, and then we'll, we'll go back through and really uh, get into the details as to what, what is this noble cause in the Christian life that's really worth contending for. Let's hear God's word, Jude and verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered to all the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, 
He is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in like manner, these people, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all they do, not understand, and they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them. For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees and laid on them, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. We skip down to verse 17. But you must remember Beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, they said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It's these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire to show others, others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen indeed. So as we step back and we we take all of that in, we see very clearly that this, this noble cause, this thing that is worth fighting for, is presented to us in verse 3. You might look again at it, where Jude says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. You might think about this verse as a giant hinge point of the book. See, Jude originally set out to write this letter of encouragement about our common salvation, yet he found himself compelled for for one reason or another, which we'll explore in a bit, to pivot and to focus the main theme of his letter on contending for the faith to contend or, or to fight for or to labor strenuously for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. There's a lot of questions about that, and I would offer uh, three questions, clarifying questions, that I think will help to maybe guide us through as a roadmap this New Testament letter. We're going to look this morning at the who, the why, and the how of contending for the faith. So we answer these questions. Who must contend? Why must they contend? And how must they contend? So if you're an outline person, there's your outline. And we look first at at who must contend. Who is this charge given to? And the answer very simply is every Christian. Every follower of Jesus must be in the business of contending for the faith. You notice he writes in verse 1, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. What a magnificent identity. Called, beloved, and kept. These three words very often in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, given as the description for all of the people of God, not just one subgroup or another, but to to all of the people that God has made his own. And we we would benefit from touching very briefly on each of these words. First, we have called. This is that 
that powerful, effectual call that God extends to people that results in their turning from sin to Jesus. It's a call that that regenerates or brings the dead heart to new life, and it enables faith and a desire to follow Jesus as Lord. I was called. Next is beloved. And I love this because this isn't just kind of a general love that God has for the world or for all people, and certainly he, he has that love. But, but here we're talking about the particular love, the special kind of covenant love that God extends to his own people, to them, those whom he makes his children and calls into fellowship with his son. And then thirdly, we have this word kept, called, beloved, and kept. So not only does God effectually call people to himself and make them his beloved possession, he secures that relationship by keeping them, by giving an identity of safety and security and assurance. We hear the words of Jesus in the back of our minds, perhaps from John 10, where he says, My Father, who has given my sheep to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Think deeply about those three words that form the Christian identity. And as you think about that identity of those who are called, beloved, and kept, we hear Jude's all-points bulletin calling all Christians to contend. No bystanders, no bench warmers, all. And one of the most meaningful summers I've ever had in all my life was a few years ago when I helped to coach my son Topher's baseball team. I think it was maybe uh, maybe an 8-9 league or a 9-10 league or something like that. You can see a championship trophy in his hands, although that has nothing to do with this story. Uh, I just wanted to point that out to you. It's another story for another day. But one of the things that we as coaches was, was not real unique, but that we tried to emphasize to all the kids was that regardless of where we were in the game, regardless of where they were in the field, was the importance of everybody keeping their head in the game. Right? If you've ever played organized sports or coach, that's maybe something you've heard or said before. Whether they were in the infield, the outfield, right field, shortstop, even everybody had to do a little round on the bench. Even if you were sitting on the bench, there was a, a role for you to play in the game. And every now and then, we'd have to slap the cage and remind everybody to, to keep their heads in the game. This is not that unlike what Jude is doing at the beginning of this letter. He's, he's slapping the cage, and he's saying, folks, something urgent is happening that demands your attention. The business of contending for the faith, and everyone is invited to the party. In fact, everyone is required to attend. I wonder if some of us here this morning are glued to the ministry bench, totally disengaged from gospel work and the work of contending. That glue that keeps us stuck to the bench takes many forms, doesn't it? It might be apathy or, or laziness or busyness, just don't have time, or maybe just kind of a straight-up unwillingness. You know, the the pastors and the elders and the, the Sunday school teachers will handle that. I mean, I, this is why I give, so that, so that they can just take care of that. And while it's true, we know as we read the New Testament that the pastors and elders and leaders uh, have a unique part in contending for the faith, here Jude is not writing to the elders of the church. He's not addressing, as Paul did in Acts chapter 20, only the leaders of the church. He's calling all Christians Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's kind of a spiritual insecurity that has you stuck on the bench. You know, I think about those three words, beloved and called and kept. And for some of you, it may just be this morning as simple as remembering who God has made you in Christ. To not be paralyzed by spiritual insecurity, but to remember that you are beloved and you are called and you are kept in Christ. And so we get to work, don't we? And yet it's not really enough to just answer the who of contending, right? We, we also need to, to ask some other questions. For example, why? Why is this such a big deal in the first place? And this happens to be the next question that Jude himself addresses. Why must we contend? Well, quite simply, it's the value of the gospel and the vices of its enemies. 
to this combination of the value of the gospel and the vices of its enemies. First, the immeasurable value of the unchanging gospel that we see in verse 3. And we see it, interestingly, in the description that he gives of the faith. So he calls all Christians to contend for the faith, look at it in verse 3, that was once delivered to all the saints. Now that is a really important and interesting description. Because if you're like me, so oftentimes when you hear the word faith, you think about the personal faith that we place in the person of Jesus for salvation, right? And, and that's right. That's, that's biblical. That's actually not what Jude is talking about here. Here Jude is talking about a kind of fixed objective faith, more so than, than he's talking about a personal subjective faith in Jesus. Dick Lucas, who's a longtime pastor, Bible teacher, offers, a, I think, a helpful clarification here. He says the faith is those things which, which we believe rather than the fact that we believe them. In other words, he says the simple Christian truths which have been seen as the gospel, that saves. And so thinking about the, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints in this capacity, we, we realize very quickly how immeasurably valuable it is. I mean, this is the, the same gospel that Paul in Romans 1 calls the power of God for salvation. It's the same gospel that he refers to in 1 Corinthians 15 as the gospel in which we stand and by which are being saved. And so we see very clearly that we contend because of the value of the gospel, the value of that faith once delivered. But there's another why. The other why is the vices of gospel enemies. And we see that in verse 4. You notice his logic. He calls all Christians to contend. And then in verse 4, the linking word for, certain people have crept in unnoticed. And what have they done? They've perverted the grace of God into sensuality, and they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So we also contend because like it or not, the gospel has enemies. And what Jude is reminding us very clearly, this is a contemporary book, these vices and enemies are often closer than we realize. In this case, these false teachers were perverting the grace of God. They were denying the lordship of Jesus. And essentially, these, these wolves were turning gospel liberty into godless license. God is gracious, they'd say. He's the God who forgives. He's full of grace. So do what you want. There's grace to cover all of that. You see something you want, you take it. There's grace for that. It's in a way. Not that unlike the kind of errant thinking that the Apostle Paul dealt with. If you were here for the Roman series, these words will ring true from Romans 6. He says, what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? By no means, Paul says. How can we who died to sin still live in it? But that didn't stop these, these false teachers. So Jude goes on in verses 5 to 16 to absolutely fillet them. He lays them bare. And he does so, um, interestingly, by citing a lot of historical examples to illustrate their foolishness and to prove their certain doom. Now, this is where the book gets really interesting and a little sticky. And time doesn't allow us to, to dive deeply into every one of the examples. But I'd like to look at least at one. And so why don't we look at, at the example that Jude gives us in verse 9 where he mentions uh, Michael the archangel contending with the devil. I mean, that sounds fun, right? Let's take that one. So, so here what's happening is that Jude is likely citing an extra testamental book. So, so not a direct quotation from the Old Testament, but something uh, historical or at least familiar to his readers. And in the story, the devil basically brings accusation, as he always does, against Moses for his sins. And the argument is that because Moses is a sinner, he's a murderer, he's a coward, he does not deserve to come into the presence of God. He doesn't deserve to get into heaven. And he turns to Michael, the archangel, as the story goes, and says, yeah, I mean, this is very clearly the case, Michael, right? And rather than, than taking the bait, Michael instead appeals to the sovereignty of God, saying, the Lord rebuke you. In other words, Michael didn't attempt to usurp the authority of God in pronouncing judgment. He left that to the Lord. He remembered his proper place. And the major point here with this, and, and actually with all of Jude's examples, is not so much the literal event as it is the illustration and the point that he makes all through verses 5 to 16 in appealing to the past to show the present vices of these 
grumblers and malcontents, as he calls them, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. God will judge. And he will because these false teachers and enemies of the gospel have stripped the gospel of Christ's lordship and authority, which, of course, is no gospel at all, is it? So we might ask how this all flows down to us today. There's a lot to unpack there. And I think there's just a couple, I'll mention just a couple simple points of application that we can consider. The the first is that we just need to be on the lookout for false teachers. And the reason is because of that little chilling phrase in verse 4. It's the phrase, crept in. Did you catch it? For certain people have crept in unnoticed. See, typically a false teacher is not going to walk through the doors and announce himself or herself as a false teacher. They creep in. So we have to be on guard and look for a lot of the warning signs that, that Jude gives us here. They're shepherding themselves. They're, they're greedy. They're rejecting authority. They're godless. They're immoral people. Second, I, I think similarly, we, we've just got to grow in our discernment about what we're allowing to teach us, both inside and outside the church. I mean, we are constantly in the information age being taught, being taught by our culture, we're being taught by the articles we read, and so I think it's good to take inventory from time to time as to who our masters and teachers really are. And believe it or not, believe it or not, we actually have to discern the iTunes top 10 religion podcasts. Believe it or not, we actually have to discern the best-selling Christian books in America. It's good for us to remember those things which are denying so many of the essential aspects of the gospel, perverting the grace of God, denying the lordship of Jesus, are really just masquerading as helpful resources or even Christian resources. Thirdly, uh, and this is very simple, I think we've just got to be careful to avoid the very sins of these false teachers themselves. Of, Of leveraging the grace of God as a license for sin. Cheapening the grace of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Costly grace, and I love this, is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. And that's exactly right, isn't it? I mean, the heart of the gospel, the essence of the gospel is the supreme lordship of the risen Christ. If you've been here the last few weeks, we've heard of his glorious return. And if he is who he said he was, and if he is the risen king, then then he actually is the one who gets to establish the priorities for our life and the agenda for our life. He gets the final say. We don't. So you might be here and you say, Chris, that's fine. I, I would never explicitly deny the orthodox truths of the lordship and the divinity of Jesus, and that may be true enough, but I wonder, I wonder if we're allowing that lordship to leak down into all the nooks and, and crannies. Of life. You know, sometimes I, I say this by way of personal confession. I just need to grow in stepping back and asking the Master Jesus what he thinks about how I'm spending my time or my money or what I'm giving my affections to. I might even carve out some time to talk to the Lord about that this week. And, and I pray that the, the Lordship of Jesus would just swell in your life and in your family. So, this is the why. We have the who, right? All Christians, all Christians must contend because of the great value of the gospel, the vices of its enemies, but there is a huge question that remains unanswered to this point. All the pragmatists in the room say amen. How? How do we do it? A lot of talk about contending for the faith, but how do we do it? We might summarize it simply in this last section as looking in, looking out, and looking up. We contend by looking in, and out and up. Let's look at each of them. First, we contend by looking in. We see it in verse 20. Look again with me. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Listen, we we are right to deal with false teachers and their false gospels. We must do it. But here Jude reminds us that contending for the faith also requires a healthy layer of honest self-care, a looking inward, 
the primary imperative we catch here is in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, the love of God. And we already heard uh, at the beginning of this letter, right, that we, the people of God, are beloved by him, that God has set his saving affection on us. And now, interestingly, we're told to keep ourselves in that great love. Now, if that's still a little obscure for you, you keep myself in the love of God, and what does it mean to be in the love of God? I I think uh, the Lord Jesus himself really offers a, a helpful point of clarification here from John chapter 15, where he says, abide in my love. There we have it. And then he clarifies, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. In other words, abiding in the love of God is obeying the word of God. And and in this, we see that obeying the word of God and and therefore abiding in his love aren't just expressions of Christian faithfulness, and they are that, but they are also a tool to leverage in the work of contending for the faith. So we keep ourselves in the love of God. And, And Jude says, oh, and by the way, a couple of more tools for your tool bag. You keep yourselves in the love of God, and as you're doing that, verse 20, you're to build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Build yourself up. I think it's interesting uh, that this is the same faith that Jude has been teaching us to contend for, isn't it? So the faith that we contend for also happens to be the faith that builds us up. And and I love that he he tells us here strongly that, that this is to happen as we're together, to build yourselves up. This is a community activity. And for some of you, you know, that might be the biggest takeaway from the morning. You know, the reason that you, you very often feel like the bug and not the windshield in the Christian life is because you're flying all by yourself. It's not what you tells us to do. He says, build yourselves up. And so this could just be as simple as saying, you know what, I've got to reorganize my summer schedule. I've got to make time for the family of God whether it's a summer Bible study or, or, or being here on Sunday morning or finding another person within this family of God to, to, to build up and to be built up by, these are, are very, very practical things that we're talking about. So we're to build up, but we're also, uh, verse 20, we saw to be praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Now, this is not uh, some bonus level of prayer. It's not a, a secret level that you unlock in a certain way as much as it is just the ordinary powerful, spirit-enabled Christian prayer. And we know that as we look at the context in verse 19, just before, Jude identifies the false teachers, you might look at it, as those devoid of the Spirit. In other words, he's saying, they're not even Christians. They're masquerading. He said, but but not you. You, on the other hand, you have the Spirit. And so pray in and by the Spirit. Rest in his intercession on your behalf. Certainly, as we think about the the heaviness of the business of contending for the faith, we need God's help. And so we pray. This is what it means to look in as we contend. Next in in, uh, the how-to manual for contending is looking out. Certainly, in a way, we talked about that earlier as it relates to false teachers by by looking out. But, but verse 22, I think, is, is really helpful to round it out when he says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear. And just as some of us were getting ready to grab our torches and pitchforks, Jude says, oh, and by the way, have mercy on those who doubt. It is no coincidence that Jude, in verse 2 of his letter, as he's writing the introduction, prays that God would multiply mercy to them. Well, now he tells them what to do with it. Give it away. Save others, he says, by snatching them out of the fire. You ever burned anything? You ever been burned? The image... Jude is painting here for us is striking, and it should absolutely make us uncomfortable. Those who are playing with false doctrine or unrepentant sin are playing with fire and in great, great danger. And how I and I think we need to grow in our urgency of what's at stake here. 
is contending for the faith is no game. This is an eternal work, and I, and I pray this morning that together we would, we would repent of, of these sins of apathy toward the mission of contending, this I am not my brother's keeper kind of mindset, and that we would together build one another up, but also look out and be eager to show mercy and to snatch others from the fire. And, you know, it's with that, I just I have to say at this point, I'm feeling overwhelmed at this point in the text. Right? I mean, we've got many dangers and toils and snares around us. We've got these false teachers that have crept in. We've got these massive exhortations that Jude is laying out for us. And then we have the stark reality of our own failures to execute. Our own lack of conviction, our screwed up priorities. And it brings us woefully short of rightly contending for this most noble cause. How can we do it? How can we possibly do this? The answer is in our final look. Not so much in or out, as important as those things are, as we just saw, but up. And what happens when we look up? Well, we see the majestic summit that Jude has been walking us up all along, we see that our battle for the faith is really sustained by the blessings of the faith. It ultimately, our battle for the faith is sustained by the blessings of the faith. Listen and rejoice in verse 24. Now, he says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You see, this is not just a salutation of the letter. Sincerely, Jude. This is the great crescendo for how we contend for the faith. It tells us the great news of how this actually happens, and it's that our battle for the faith is ultimately sustained by the blessings of the faith, the external blessings that God brings to us in Christ. I mean, <laughs> to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, I am a stumbler. You are a stumbler. I mean, have you ever seen a toddler walk? They, they kind of have this wobble, right? Like they go and, and they're kind of tipping, and then before you know it, they've wobbled their way and stumbled down a flight of stairs or something. I mean, they just kind of had this wobble walk that can be very dangerous at times. What is the only way that you can guarantee a young toddler from stumbling as they walk. Like any good parent, you come around them. You take their hands and you keep them from stumbling. That is how we contend. And that is the most wonderful news, how, how I need to hear this, to know that, that yes, I keep myself, and like that young toddler, I'm putting one foot in front of the other, and yet I keep myself ultimately because God is keeping me. He's holding us fast. Our battle for the faith, friends, is sustained by the blessings of the faith, that he will keep us from stumbling. And, and, and he goes on, to him who is able to present you blameless, Me? Blameless? <laughs> this is one of the greatest blessings of the faith that, that unworthy, sinful people are not saved by their own strength or works or merits, but by the perfect merit and righteousness of the Lord Jesus himself. Righteousness that is given and imputed to anyone who puts their faith in Jesus and righteousness that will stand up until the final day. 
This is the prize. This is the great blessing that sustains our present battle. To know that the blessings of salvation, that on the cross, Jesus Christ was contending for us long before we ever even had the chance to contend for him. He was contending against sin and the devil and death, and by way of his resurrection, he has won. And that blessing, that sustaining blessing, is what propels us forward. And it is good news that our battle for the faith truly is sustained by the blessings of the faith. You know, it's interesting that Jude started out his letter by saying that his original intention was to write a letter of encouragement about our common salvation. You might remember it from back in verse 3. You know, I wonder if Jude didn't get there after all. Because, indeed, our battle for the faith is sustained by the great and glorious blessings of the faith. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. authority before all time and now and forever. Our battle for the faith is sustained by the blessings of the faith. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, we are thankful for the way in which you lavish the blessings of salvation on us. And that is such good news as we think about the many dangers and toils and snares around us. And we are thankful, as the old song says, grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. This is your staying power that you give to us. And I pray that in light of that staying power, in, in light of those glorious gospel blessings, the privilege of being a Christian, that that we would be fueled along for the work, that we would look in and grow in our deference to the lordship of Jesus Christ, our master, that we would be aware as we look out for those toils and snares, that we would be eager to, to, to contend in the sense of snatching others from the fire. You will deepen our conviction in that area. And that at the end of the day, we would lift our eyes to the hills and say, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who has saved and is sustaining me even in this moment. We give you praise for that in Jesus' name.